Revelation 3.14 says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. If you notice, the verse said, The church of the Laodiceans, while the other churches are said like the church in Smyrna and not the church of Smyrna. This could possibly show that the church in Laodicea thinks really highly of themselves. The church of Laodicea. They think they are their own church. And this verse reveals some things about our Savior. First we see he is the Amen because he gets the final word. He is also said here to be the faithful and true witness. That is what he is called in Revelation 19.11 when he comes back at the second advent. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus Christ is faithful and true to the church, and you should be the same way to your wife. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14 also says, He is the beginning of the creation of God. And this doesn't mean he is a created being, but rather that he is one, the one who began creation. If you look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Even before Jesus Christ was born as a man, he existed. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Adam was made in the image of God, and Jesus Christ was born in the image of God. Colossians 1.18 calls him the firstborn from the dead. He is the first person born of God. Old Testament saints weren't born again showing a difference in Old Testament and New Testament salvation. And now we see some things about the works of this church in Laodicea, or of Laodicea, and they aren't very good works. Revelation 3.15 says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This shows that some saints make God sick. And God most times is an extremist. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. There is no in-between like purgatory. And the best illustration for this is hot and cold tea is better than lukewarm tea. Also, something else to get out of this is that being lukewarm can also refer to being satisfied. Satisfied in our service toward God. We shouldn't get satisfied with it. We should be wanting to do better. We should stay on fire for God and not get content with our works. We should always be wanting to do better works. We should try to get better constantly. Another reason lukewarm could refer to them being satisfied is because in verse 17, it says they have need of nothing. Revelation 3.17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So they think that they're rich and have need of nothing because they are content. A rich person could have it so easy that they get content with everything they have. And they don't call to God in times of trouble because they don't have much trouble. They say they are rich, but they are really poor. The church in Smyrna is the opposite. They are in poverty but God says, they are rich. James 2, 5 says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Notice that the majority of the time, rich men are talked about in a very negative light throughout the Bible. The rich men in, in hell in Luke 16 uh, he's talked about in a negative light. Uh, the Bible talks about rich men getting rich by fraud and being oppressors. 
and while reading the general epistles, which are geared more towards the time of Jacob's trouble, you will see you will see a theme of God bashing rich men. This is because for a man to be rich in the time of Jacob's trouble, they have to take the mark. And First Timothy sixteen says, "For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after." They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Uh, pornography, sex trafficking, drug dealing, alcohol, and any evil you can think of is here because of the love of money. And you see these reality shows of rich celebrities, and those people aren't rich. They are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind and naked. They have no clue what this life is about. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. So these Laodiceans have need of nothing, so they say. And they got this way on their own. They think they are so accomplished, but they are actually wicked. And anyone good that we have, anything good we have, we got it from God. The Bible says in Philippians 4, God shall supply all your need. These Laodiceans are increased with goods. That is because they are setting up treasure on earth. Have you ever heard of the show Hoarders? Some people are so worldly that they set up so many treasures that they run out of places to put their treasures. They run out of room. Their house gets so full they can't even walk. Uh, these people are wretched, as the verse says, and they don't even know it. The Laodiceans. Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We are all wretches, and we all need God. The saying is true that misery loves company. The verse said they are miserable. So the rich are miserable. Most rich people, even though they they don't they think they don't need God and they get content with just having their self. They end up being miserable because they continue to want more and more riches. The verse says they're rich and miserable. Misery loves company. And that is why rich people always have some big entourage with them. Ezekiel thirty-two thirty-one talks about how Pharaoh is comforted over all his multitude slain by the sword. And that is a picture of Satan in hell. He will get comfort over lost sinners being in hell with him. Misery loves company. The verse in Revelation chapter 3 also says they are blind. The Bible talks about Satan blinding the minds of people to the gospel. Some people become blind to the word of God because they want to try to change it. Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, and that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Notice the verse said, Buy of me gold, try and tried in the fire. And this has to do with them giving glory to God through trials and tribulations. First Peter one seven says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. If they do this, they will be rich. They may end up in poverty on this earth like the church in Smyrna, but they will be rich in faith. They will also get white raiment. Revelation 19.8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, Clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Our righteousness will show in our clothes. We're going to have fine linen, clean and white. Just like the men who get the mark of the beast, their unrighteousness will show in their clothes. Because they took the mark, and they will get a noisome and grievous sore, similar to leprosy, which will stain their garments. That is why Jude said, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We shouldn't treat people different over their clothing, but even today you can tell a lot about a person by how they dress. If they dress in all black, then they might be headbangers or 
gothic. If they dress like a rapper, they probably listen to rap music. But we will one day be clothed in a way that shows our righteousness. Uh, Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Many will be ashamed when they get to either judgment. If we get to the judgment seat of Christ without any good works and any good service toward God, then we will be found naked without any rewards. And men at the great white throne judgment who are lost will be naked without clothes, but just having the filthy rags of their own self-righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 3 says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall be not, not be found naked. Then Jesus says, Anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. This church is blind. And if you aren't blind spiritually, then you can see what the lost world can't see. You can see the wickedness in things that are invisible to most people. And that is why a lost person or a backslid Christian will say, You just see the bad in everything. And that is because... We aren't blinded by Satan, and we don't have the wool pulled over our eyes by a wolf in sheep's clothing. Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Uh, God disciplines those he loves, just like a parent disciplines their kids. A good parent chastens their kids so that they don't become a heathen. A bad parent disciplines their kid out of hatred. And the first parent resembles God, the last parent resembles Satan. If God chastens you, then you need to repent and be zealous. That is the correct response. But some people are so tough and stupid for their own good. They will continue to live wicked even though God is beating them and ch chastising them. Isaiah 1 5 says, Why should you be stricken any more? You, re, you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. They despise the chastening of the Lord. And to despise his chastening is the wrong response. Hebrews 12, 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. I'm glad that God still bothers me about sin and keeps me in line and chastises me. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Many will use this verse in soul winning, which it is a good verse for that. But really, this is aimed at this church. Jesus is standing at the door wanting to have fellowship with anyone who will let him in. Revelation 3.21 says, To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. The reward for them overcoming is that they will get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. The sayings are true, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. And then the last verse Revelation 3.22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'd like to present you the gospel. Uh, if you're not saved, then you shouldn't be worried about trying to learn the book of Revelation yet. But the gospel is this. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is this. The Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross. He died for your sins. He was then buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. When he rose again the third day, that proved he was God in the flesh. And you need him as your Savior because you are a sinner. And you cannot 
pay for your own sins. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says everyone is a sinner. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So, the price you're going to have to pay if you stay in your sin is death. That's a physical death. And then one day, you're going to face a second death where you're cast into the lake of fire. But Jesus Christ died for you. He died for your sins. And anyone that will come to him as a guilty sinner can be saved. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How do you believe on Jesus Christ? You don't just believe that he existed. And you don't just believe that he died on the cross. You take it a step further and put your trust in what he did on the cross to be your payment for sin. Put every bit of your trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross as your payment. Quit trusting in living a good life. Quit trusting in going to church. Quit trusting in water baptism. Quit trusting in any good thing that you're doing. And put all your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're willing to do that, come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner. Put your trust in His finished payment on the cross. Then you can be saved and have eternal life. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So anybody that comes to Him and wants to be saved, He's going to save them no matter who they are and no matter what they've done. But I hope you will believe the gospel today before it's too late.